security integrating into uh, larger opportunities. I'm pleased to introduce Innovonics, and I've got Eric Banghart, who is the manager of global sales that I'd like to introduce first. So, Eric, good morning, good afternoon, welcome. The floor is yours. Oh, one last thing I forgot. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A box and we will answer them at the end of today's webinar. Eric, join us, please. All right, good day and thanks for joining. It's Eric Banghart, Manager of Global Sales here at Innovonics. Uh, today we endeavor to show you some of the key advantages of making wireless a part of your alarm and security arsenal. Uh, armed with his PSP superpowers and decades of experience in the industry, our own Rocky Mountain Territory Manager, Sandy Fisher, will guide you through the presentation helping you to help your customers by utilizing a wide variety of wireless applications. Please feel free to share comments and questions, as Mike said, throughout the presentation, and we'll get to those of the Q&A at the end. With no further ado, please give it up for Sandy Fisher. Sandy, the screen is yours. Good morning, everybody. Very happy you're here with us. So let's just go ahead and jump right in to the Innovonics wireless overview. So we manufacture a, a life safety grade wireless uh, designed for life safety applications in the security industry. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an illustration about what 900 megahertz does, but basically the higher frequency has a shorter associated wavelength and that's what propagates uh, through and in between construction materials made out of metal in commercial and industrial environments. And, and that's very important for commercial applications. Uh, and it also, so in addition to uh, long range on large premises uh, or propagation, it also accomplishes fill or saturation, meaning it fills the entire space without dead spots. And it does both of those at a low energy, meaning low current draw. And what that translates to is years of long battery life. It's also frequency hopping spread spectrum, which means it, it avoids radio interference. For example, uh, our, our panic buttons are used at every major US airport, which is a, an example of a uh, RF challenging environment. Uh, we also are transmitting a very small amount of data, very small bandwidth, and that allows the receiver to be very sensitive, which means it could hear a weaker signal. So for example, let's say I've just got to tell you a few words or a sentence, and you and I are on opposite ends of the same room. I can almost whisper them and you'll understand me. But if I have to read you a whole page, you'll start missing information because there's, there, there's too much information. I would either have to speak up or we would have to move closer to each other. Think about what happens if your Wi-Fi signal strength gets low, your speed slows down. So the more data you're shuttling, the more bandwidth you need, the less data, the less bandwidth you need. And that's what Innovonics does. And that's our strategy for getting that life safety radio message from point A to point B. Uh, now, this is not Wi-Fi. This is what we call built for purpose, so it does not require IT management. You basically plug in the repeaters, you power up the transmitters, program the panel or the receiver, and you're all set. So there's no uh, um, IP kind of management required for this. So I'll show you our, uh, our transmitter endpoint sensors, how our repeaters work. I'll show you how we integrate with any platform, including alarm panels, video systems and access control platforms. And, uh, oh. and uh, we'll talk about some applications as well. But the bottom line here is Innovonics is very well suited for physical security and life safety messaging. And uh, we have a, a, a many, many years, three decades of proven performance in life safety applications. So uh, in, in general, uh, using wireless is going to save you a lot of time and labor expense. And when it comes to panic and duress alarms, I like to talk about this in terms of, of actual 
physical security theory, and this is cost-effective risk mitigation. So let's let's make sure when we're when we're working on a physical security plan, we separate the concepts of threat and risk. So threat is the bad thing that can happen, and there can be varying degrees of likelihood. Risk is the result of that threat having occurred. And there's different types of uh, approaches for risk management. In the security industry, what we do, the name of the game for us with our end user customers is risk mitigation. We reduce that impact, that outcome of a threat having occurred. So think of, as an example, panic alarms used by staff members at a behavioral health setting. If they can communicate a situation where they need help because maybe a client is becoming violent, and they're about to experience a violent attack, if they can summon help quickly and easily, that would reduce the outcome of that attack. So that that's risk mitigation. And using panic buttons, like I said, is a very cost-effective risk mitigation. If you ever want to talk more about physical security planning, I'm always happy to, to, to have those conversations with you. We even have a one-hour CEU class on a structured approach to, to physical security planning. When I say hand in hand with video, think about uh, motion triggered video events and that can sometimes or many times result in lots of useless footage. For example, let's say in a challenging scene uh, with a video camera outdoors or at night. Uh, so at night when the camera's automatic gain control comes on, that can introduce a lot of noise into the picture which can be misinterpreted as motion. Or if you have a, uh, an outdoor scene and or, or at a distance and there's moving foliage and things like that or different um, aspects of, of sunlight that can compromise motion triggered video and what that can result in is is uh, too many distractions for the video system operator so in those challenging scenes you can use a wireless motion sensor at the scene in question and use that to trigger the camera's video to to increase capture and increase storage and to notify an operator of an event. Uh, also with when uh, you have wireless endpoints going into access control, panic buttons can initiate lockdown. You can monitor uncontrolled openings. I'll talk about that a little bit where you have a transmitter on a side door or a back door that might go otherwise unmonitored and we have a receiver that would go into a spare zone on, uh, on a door controller. So now you're providing alerts of a prop door, for example. You can also use our buttons for wireless door release. Uh, whenever you are hooking up a wireless receiver uh, in that situation, always go into a controller if you can, never directly into the strike because you don't want that to log as a forced entry. So this access control application, Take, take uh, one of our transmitters with the door contact, and whatever the most appropriate door contact is. And then uh, what you would do from there is take our four channel receiver, our EN4204R that gives you relay outputs. You can uh, run power right from the door controller or one of the power supplies in the access control equipment closet. And then again, take our relay output into any one of the spare uh, inputs on any of the controllers. So now you are, uh, uh, very easily integrating a side door or a back door, or as I call it, an uncontrolled opening, so that it is now monitored by any access control system. Um, again, with video, we talked about how that can um, reduce operator distractions and make uh, motion triggered video more meaningful. And uh, I, I will also talk about the different uh, access control and video platforms that we play into. Um, <clears throat> some of these platforms you can buy from ADI, others you can't, but but you can always get the Unavonics parts from ADI. So we'll talk about uh, how we integrate with RS2 and open options with a direct interface, ICT Protege, more of a Canadian thing right now, but they are expanding into the US. Uh, we can also go directly into Milestone XProtect and Genentech Security Center. Um, also for um, a great application for wireless is perimeter monitoring. 
And the earlier you can detect an intruder, the sooner uh, the response can be notified and arrive to interrupt that adversary and to do what they do. So, um, so think about, um, uh, well, it's called detect delay response. So detection is when the alarm is tripped and ideally verified and notified. Delay is, is the clock that's ticking from that point to when the intruder reaches the target or you know whatever it is that they're looking to accomplish. And you want delay time to be longer than response time so the response gets there in time. So again, perimeter detection, uh, when it makes sense uh, for the application that we're talking about will uh, um, help achieve that goal. <clears throat> again, we talked about 900 megahertz wireless um, in commercial environments and it is that short wavelength that's going to propagate in between all these um, openings made out of metal. So what is unique to Linovonics is, the, is to be able to accomplish multiple repeater hops at 900 megahertz. So you can go from transmitter, whether it's a door, motion, or a panic, to repeater, to repeater, to repeater, to repeater, and then finally into the head end receiver. So the EN5040T, that is our main repeater, <clears throat> does not need any kind of home run wiring. It's basically plug and play. You can program it as a supervised point so that you would get a notification if there's a tamper on a repeater or an AC power loss indicating that it is switched over to its onboard backup battery. Um, <coughs> pardon me. And ideally you'll put a repeater in a closet or an IDF where it's out of, harm, out of harm's way and where it can uh, easily access uh, standard line power. So a standard 110 outlet. Uh, power transformer is included. Uh, for those of you in Canada, you might want to get your own 12 volt DC power supply and order our repeater, the EN 5040, without the T. <clears throat> so those are the repeaters, very powerful capability of Innovonics. Toward the end, I'll show you our survey kit, which is how we determine what kind of wireless range you're going to get, how many repeaters you need, and where they go. <clears throat> so let's now jump into uh, some of our alarm panel interfaces. <clears throat> so the EN7290 receiver will take as many Innovonics transmitters as you need and put them directly into a Honeywell Vista 128 or a 250. Our receiver sits on the ECP bus or the keypad bus. It's full point to point for alarms and troubles. Programs up just like Honeywell Wireless meaning your installers, if they know how to install Honeywell Wireless and a Vista panel, then they already know how to, to fully integrate Innovonics into a Vista panel. We can also go directly into Bosch B-Series and G-Series. You can get all the B-Series stuff at ADI. Again, it's a full direct interface, uh, point to point. And the receiver for that is actually a Bosch part number, ENKIT-SDI2. So that'll work on all the, the B-series panels. And just like with Honeywell Vista, however many uh, zones the panel has, that's how many transmitters you can add. For those of you in Canada and probably coming soon, more widespread here in the US, ICT Protege, this is a, a, a great uh, emerging combo platform, access control, and Berg. And we have a direct interface with them. That IN-PRT-IVO-IF is the Innovonics receiver interface. That is a ICT part number in the ADI system. So if you're looking at using that platform, we can go straight into there as well. This is fairly new. A number of you systems integrators and dealers do building management in addition to physical security. And there is a very healthy interoperability mindset in building management and commercial HVAC. It's called BACnet. 
Uh, backend over IP is a, is a protocol that all of those systems can use. So we have a receiver, the EN4080, and you get the LIC backnet. That's a one-time, very inexpensive license charge. It's what we call a reporter. So that re receiver, which is IP connected, outputs in backnet format. And that uses about half of our transmitters. There's doors, motions, and panics that are compatible with that. So our doors, motions, and panics would present as binary inputs. We have temperature and humidity sensors, which would show up as analog inputs, and those will go into any building management platform. And we are seeing more examples of how physical security and building management are converging so that that uh, savvy commercial end user can leverage their platform investment to accomplish uh, multiple applications. So think about uh, occupant comfort, energy savings for occupancy detection in a conference room. So you can have a wireless motion in there so that the air conditioning is on or off if the room is empty or full, thus saving energy. Also think about, uh, for example, a massive building automation platform in a hotel. You could use that backnet network to add our panic buttons and give them to uh, hotel housekeeping staff. So building management uh, via BACnet for Minimonics. For anything that we don't have a specific interface for, we still have the add-on receivers. They just give you relay outputs that will go into zone inputs on any platform. So we have three, I call them small, medium, and large. The, uh, the EN4232MR, EN4216MR, and the EN4204R. They have 11, 5, and 4 alarm outputs respectively along with that one last uh, trouble output, which would go into a zone, which would be like a service call zone. So you know if there's a tamper or a low battery or a supervision alert. So those are the add-on receivers. Let's talk about some of the <coughs> transmitter endpoints, what we call the universals. So here's the list of them, different part numbers. They all behave a little bit differently, but they basically accomplish the same thing, which is gonna give you a change of state alarm on uh, well when a door opens or if there's any kind of a normally open or normally closed input contact maybe uh, maybe a fault relay output from some kind of industrial equipment something like that so the en1210 will take any door contact and i would use that one for a roof hatch um, an exterior metal door you want to put the transmitter on the wall and then use an appropriate um, maybe a surface mount contact the EN1210W comes with the magnet and, it's got, and it has a read switch on board. So you put the transmitter on the door frame and the magnet on the door. So when the, mag, when the door opens, the magnet moves away and the transmitter sends its alarm. The EN1210EOL will require an end of line resistor between the contact and the transmitter. I would use that if you're using a normally open contact or if you're working off a spec that calls for an EOL. The EN1212 will take two wired inputs, and those will report as two separate zones, provided that the interface supports that functionality. So the add-on receivers do, if there's an M, M stands for multi, as well as the VISTA interface. Those with the VISTA, since each zone you can associate up to four loops, or you can choose from one to four loops, we correspond to that with our dual inputs, loop one and loop two. The EN1215s have a wall tamper and must have an EOL. And that means they are uh, commercial Berg UL listed. We also have an EN1252, our long range, that will get roughly twice the range of our, of our uh, standard power transmitters. So you would use that if you uh, can't get a repeater powered up in between point A and point B, or maybe you just have an outbuilding and it'll be less expensive just to use one high power transmitter than to get a repeater out there. Uh, in general, wireless range or distance, uh, in building and through building, I'd say is a couple hundred feet in a challenging RF environment. And then every repeater you add gives you another hop. And again, up to 10 hops, that should be enough to cover any large, massive commercial or industrial 
premise. And again, the high power is roughly uh, twice that distance. Okay, motion sensors. We have a number of PIRs. The EN 1260, uh, it's a 50 by 50, 90 degree, or you can swap out the lens, the little uh, plastic Fresnel lens with a ACC 672 LR. That'll make it into a, a 100 foot curtain. The EN 1262 is a Bosch motion with our transmitter built in. Uh, that's a nice pet immune unit. The EN 1265 is our ceiling mount. Uh, it'll cover a 60 foot diameter on the floor at a 14 foot ceiling height. Then you can swap the cap, I believe it's ACC 668 or 669, and that'll make it into a high ceiling mount uh, 25 feet with that same 60 foot diameter on the floor. If the ceiling height is shorter than that, uh, I'll leave it up to you to do the geometric calculations to show you the, uh, the reduced diameter of coverage on the floor. But this is a very nice uh, 360 ceiling mount. And then finally, we have a what we call a high traffic. It uses a bigger battery. That'll get you at least four years in high traffic. Uh, this uh, is UL Commercial Berg as well. And it's a standard coverage pattern motion. We have a number of panic buttons that can be worn or mounted. And I've just got them all listed here. So the way to decode our part numbers, all our part numbers start with EN. Uh, if there's an S on the end, that's a single button activation. A D on the end, that's a double button activation, meaning you have to press both buttons. That'll reduce your, your, your accidental activations. And a couple of them have an F that stands for fixed, meaning it would be mounted uh, under a table, for example, and there is a tamper spring. So the EN 1223S and 1223D, those are water resistant. They both come with a neck chain and a uh, belt clip, which are interchangeable. The EN 1233 versions, it's the rectangular, like an ivory color, typically worn around the neck. The EN 1235s, they're black belt clip. It's a very sturdy belt clip. And again, if, uh, if you want to mount something permanently, get the one with the F so, so if it gets pulled off or comes off, you'll get a tamper notification. There are a couple multiple conditions, a three condition and a, and a two condition. The two condition, if you press either button by itself, you get one zone. If you press both buttons at the same time, you get the second zone. So again, the receiver needs to be able to support that, like the MR add-on receivers and the Honeywell Vista interface, or EN7290. So the zone one could be a suspicious character, zone two, a double button press would be an actual holdup. The three condition, you hit the left for zone one, the right for zone two, both for zone three. Then we have an EN1224 with four buttons that, that say one, two, three, four. You could use those to activate four relays on a EN4216 MR receiver for any kind of remote relay activation application you can think of. The EN 1224N, uh, ON, I'm sorry, behaves the same, but the buttons say on off. And, that, and there's a couple of star buttons as well. That could be used as a arm disarm key fob on a Vista panel or on a Bosch panel. The bill trap, uh, these bill traps, we just uh, put them out in black. So it blends in to the bottom of a black cash drawer. That's a piece of feedback we've had for years. So, so they are now black. This is a great duress alarm device, which I distinguish from panic. Duress would be uh, when you want to activate a panic alarm without anybody knowing who you are interacting with. And a bill trap is a, is a great uh, duress alarm device because it's activated very discreetly by pulling out the bottom bill. So that bill trap would be a uh, hundreds slot of a cash drawer. You tuck the bottom bill under that flap and then you put all the other hundreds on top. So in a holdup, you pull that last bill out and that will send an alarm which can go to a zone on an alarm panel or even with our add-on receiver, it can directly trigger 
an alarm input on a camera trained on that cash handling station. So it's a great way to get a visual record of address alarm in progress. It is UL commercial and there is an optional uh, jumper setting which I recommend you use for delay. So if the clerk or teller pulls that last bill out by mistake, you can put it back in and not generate a nuisance alarm. So that's the EN1249 bill trap. Uh, we have a glass break, the EN1247, that uses the <clears throat> Interlogix, or I should say um, UTC sensor. This, this glass break has been around for a while. Uh, that will eventually change when those run out, um, but there, we, we will always have a glass break. Uh, so stay tuned for our new glass break sensor coming probably sometime next year. But that um, uh, has a 20-foot sensing range to, to uh, trip on the detection of the uh, frequencies associated with breaking framed glass. So there's the glass break. We have a smoke, EN 1244. Uh, it is UL residential. It's not 864. So this would not be used as an initiating device in a commercial setting, uh, but it, it, it is UL-268, which is a system listing. It's CSFM, California State Fire Marshal, which means if it's good enough for California, it's good enough for the rest of North America. And think about perhaps if the AHJ or the fire marshal considers a condo project to be residential, we have seen that in some states, then you can use it. We have a CO. This is a, a, a commercial grade for hospitality, not for garages, but for, think about um, daycare or hospitality. Um, it is a system sensor CO with our transmitter built in, 10-year sensor, also CSFM. UL2075 means it's a system listing, which means it is approved for use, for example, on an alarm panel. So, when, when uh, high levels of carbon monoxide are detected, this can uh, trigger the system to alert people to get out, as well as initiating the movement of air to rectify the CO situation. A couple more transmitters. We have our, our, our water detector. So this will alarm if there's standing water on the floor. It's our EN1751. You can get a Honeywell FP280 water sensor. So you put that little uh, pad on the floor, mount the transmitter on the wall next to it, and that will uh, prevent uh, um, very expensive water damage. We do have just a straight temperature alarm, which would work as a zone on an alarm panel, EN1752. The defaults are 40 for the low, 80 for the high. So out of the box, you can put it um, uh, in a standard fridge or an IT room to alert it if the temperature gets too, too high. Um, you can also change those set points with a PC application that you would get off our website. And, and we have a uh, custom USB cable that would uh, plug into the transmitter and your computer to change those set points, as well as to decide if you want to use the onboard thermistor or the um, Honeywell T280R uh, external probe. So maybe you would put that probe inside of a freezer and the transmitter on the outside. So there's a great way to do temperature alarms. A great application there, like I mentioned, in an IT closet so that you can uh, eliminate network downtime with this type of an alarm. So remember the motions I showed you, the Unovonics motions, those are for indoors and we bring those sensors in as an OEM. We build those transmitters into it and you can find those as Unovonics parts. For outdoor motion and other challenging motion applications, maybe a harsh environment, uh, we have Optex I series. So, pardon me, we send OEM board transmitters to Optex and they build them into what they call I-series. 
And if you want to learn more about that, we can get you the Optex I series booklet that shows all the detectors. There's a number of PIRs that have different coverage patterns and mounting heights. They're good for cold temperatures and outdoors. There's also uh, active IR or beams. They come in 100, 200, and 350, which is how long the beam is. So there's two sides and that's how far apart you can put them. You can double that distance indoors because that IR beam can see better indoors. So think about a set of beams along a long uh, row of dock doors in a warehouse. They're all battery powered, so you don't even have to pull power. They even have a couple of true dual techs, so wireless with Innovonics built in, dual techs, PIR microwave, for maybe a very tricky situation where uh, there's a concern of nuisance alarms, and that's what those dual techs are great for, because when the PIR detects, the microwave snaps on to verify it. So lots of great uh, options from Optex. Pictured here is one of the older units, and when you see the booklet, you'll see that they've really upgraded um, all the detectors to nice, new, really sleek looking units that look a, a lot more current, almost uh, designer-ish. Here's an application, so remote relay activation. So what you can do is put our universal transmitter on an auxiliary output or the aux output of the panel. So when the panel goes into alarm, it'll trip that transmitter. The message will go back out across the repeaters, if there are any, and that can trip an add-on receiver or even many add-on receivers, which would complete power to a low voltage loop, 12 volts up to an amp. So that could be like a remote siren, a remote sounder, like, like in, a, in a, uh, a secondary guard jack, for example. So very easy to add different points of notification, which contributes toward the efficient and timely response of an alarm situation. Okay, so all that stuff was Berg and Panic. We do have a UL864 commercial fire offering. Now this is a single point add-on and it uses our EH, not EN, because we need to keep the, the airwaves as quiet as possible for the very stringent uh, UL864 supervision requirement, which is knowing of a missing initiating device within 200 seconds. For perspective, in commercial Berg, the spec is four hours. And we usually set our, our supervision to, to one hour, so we exceed that. But for commercial fire, that supervision window is 200 seconds. That's why we use EH, and there's no repeater yet for that, at least not that is UL864. But the application here would be, for example, maybe there's no wire going to a PIV, a post indicator valve, or a pull, or a, you know, a, a, a switch or a valve, or whatever, even a four wire smoke for the for that matter. But uh, the transmitter is a universal transmitter, so it would be connected to that sensor, whether it's across the building, across the parking lot, or across the street. Then that would be programmed into the EH4104R, which would connect to five zones on any fire panel. And that's for alarm, tamper, battery missing, and jam. Sounds like a long way to go for a wireless point, but it beats $10,000 for trenching to get that wire to that one tricky remote point that would otherwise be cost prohibitive. Another great application for this fire, think about if there's a main building and there's a fully monitored commercial fire alarm system, all UL864, then they add a building next to it and there's limited wiring, limited infrastructure. So maybe there's a fire panel in that building, all the endpoints within that building are wired, but, what that, but that panel isn't connected to a monitoring station. What you could do is take our EH transmitter, put it on that remote panel's alarm output, and the receiver back in the main building's alarm panel. What that would do is if that remote building has a fire alarm, the main building's panel will communicate that to the central station on that main building's account. So that saves the monthly cost of a second account. And you would probably have to do that twice, once for the alarm side and once for the trouble side. So you would have two EH transmitters in the remote building's fire system 
one for alarm, one for troubles, and then two receivers, each taking up five zones on the main buildings panel, and again, for an alarm condition or, or a trouble condition. So that can save a lot of money in a challenging installation for a commercial fire system. So check that out as well. Okay, for determining what kind of range you're gonna get, taking the guesswork out of it, we have the EN7017 survey kit. And what I would do is get that EN7017 and then add an EN1210SK, which is not the pendant one that, that's shown there, but it's longer range. So that's more conducive of the range of a door or a motion and even our regular panic buttons. So that is a very easy way to show you how many repeaters you need and, uh, uh, and where they go, as well as it'll verify the range without a repeater if you're using our UL864 fire equipment. Uh, what I would do is check with your Innovonics rep. I'll get you all those contacts at the end of this to see how you can get a survey kit. It is very inexpensive. I think it's under a couple hundred bucks. So you can get that right off the shelf at ADI in many cases. And then we'd be happy to send you that extra EN1210SK. All you gotta do is call and ask. So that's the survey kit. And basically it works with an app on your phone. So go to your, your app store and, and, and search on Innovonics and you'll see our survey kit app. But again, a, a really great tool. Nobody should be without it if you're using Innovonics. So let's uh, summarize with the main benefits of Innovonics compared to other wireless, our wireless, we tout that it is the longest range and the most reliable of any wireless in the security industry, especially in, in, in commercial and industrial settings. You're going to save a lot of money in labor with time um, and expense, uh, reduce time on site. Now more than ever, as we've been saying for the past few months, is, is more significant than it has ever been. You can get in and get out, keeping your end user customers uh, feeling safe with uh, fewer people on their site for less time. It's also going to save the cost of the copper and the conduit and the lifts and everything that it takes to run wire in those challenging environments. Uh, obviously, we preserve site aesthetics in churches and museums and things like that. And, uh, we, you know, it, it also eliminates um, the expense of everything it takes to get that wire either underground or overhead. That picture I showed you early is a great illustration of what we eliminate uh, when it comes to trenching and cutting up concrete. The ability to integrate into any and every type of security system that's that's unique to Innovonics right now in, in the commercial space. And that really gives you the flexibility to meet the goals of the overall physical security plan. And it's always easy to add panic buttons on to round out the design of any physical security platform. So it's relevant wherever you go. So some qualifiers uh, that would tell you if it makes sense for you to use an Avonics. Probably the biggest one is, do you do alarms in commercial? Um, let's see how we're doing on time. Here we're good on time. So if you do alarms in commercial, Innovonics is right for you. And again, what kind of panels do you use? We will go directly into Honeywell, Bosch, we'll go into Paycom. For you Stanley and, San and Sonitrol people out there, we go into the FlexiBase and FlexIP panels directly as well. If you use RS2 open options, you can get our EN6080 receiver, and that will work in cahoots with the Mercury 1501 board. You can get the receiver on the Innovonics parts right here at ADI. And uh, we'll go directly into those systems. The EN6080 is also what is used to run us directly into Milestone X Protect. Mm -hmm. And then you get an interface license called uh, BTX Bridge to X Protect by Aptex. So if you're gonna run into Milestone, um, let us know, we can help you spec that out. The EN4080 receiver, which is our backnet, that's what goes into Genentech Security Center. And they're not reselling our parts either. So, so what you do is you get the EN4080 with the LIC backnet, and you can put us right on, on a Genentech, 
Genentech Security Center network. And then again, we talked about ICT Protege. We'll go directly into that. And if you do any building management, uh, including commercial HVAC, if you use Delta Controls, uh, Honeywell Niagara, Allerton, Schneider, Andover, Metasys, all of those systems, those can all handle BACnet, so we can interface directly into those. Okay, we are not flying just yet, but we can drive on a day trip if necessary. We have learned that there's a lot we can do remotely and over the phone and through Zoom and via email as well. We can look at site plans and help give you a really good guess as to how many repeaters you need if you're in a bid situation. Um, but if it makes sense for us to get together with you in the field, uh, Dave LaPuma lives in Northern California. I'm here in Colorado. Bill Walker lives near Chicago. Bob Mendenhall lives near Houston. Chris is in Baltimore. He's a road warrior, as is Rita. She's in South Carolina. She can reach a number of places in, in the uh, uh, Southeast on a day trip. So that is our contact info. We have a territory map we can share with you as well. So what I'm gonna do is go back to the main screen here and let's open it up to questions. Great, thanks Sandy. And I actually, I did send a link over through the chat with our regional sales manager map and um, a link to our site so you can kind of find your sales manager. Uh, we do have some questions. Let me go ahead and pull them up here. Let's see. Okay, first question. How does the bill trap work in a metal drawer? It works. Uh, the 900 megahertz we've seen will sneak out of uh, little creases and seams, even in a safe. Uh, now, when the cash drawer is opened, when and that last bill is pulled out, so there's so the signal really will propagate out of there. Uh, the challenge I've seen is sometimes if that cash drawer is pulled out at night and then stuck into a safe, then you get a supervision alert in the morning. A couple different things you can do there is maybe set a longer supervision window for that system or for that endpoint, or stick a repeater up in the vault or on the outside of the vault. And again, that, that, that wireless signal will, will creep out, believe it or not. And uh, so you can uh, accomplish that supervision if the cash drawer is going into a vault at the end of the day. Okay, great. Um, next question, does the Innovonics temperature sensor work with other probes? The temperature sensor, no, it's gotta be a T2ADR. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, next question here is, how is the Innovonics how do the Innovonics buttons tie directly to Genetech? Uh, so you would get the EN4080 receiver and that has IP output and, and, and you get the LIC BACnet as well. So those are both in ADI's Adonis uh, quoting system. And you would need to get the Genetech BACnet plugin um, as well so that it is licensed to run on Genetech Security Center. And the way you configure our receiver is with a text file and a USB stick. So, uh, you know, for you Bosch dealers out there, think about how you ram a panel. Um, this is a similar function where you, when you get the receiver, you put a USB stick in, you hit a couple buttons and look at some lights and it'll pull the template. Then you use something like WordPad++ and you expand the text file, which is how you configure the list of transmitters that are gonna be supervised. So you, you add all the transmitter IDs and a, and a description for them and a BACnet instance, like, which is like an object number. Then you load that in to the EN4080 receiver and then it will start out putting those messages in BACnet and, uh, that, and that, re that receiver would be an IP device on a Genetech network 
and it will correspond and it works great. Okay, great. So it's actually pretty easy to set up. Okay. Um, next question is, how do you tell what receiver to use? I would start with what panel or access control or video system are you using? Based on that, we'll know if there's a direct interface or not. So for Honeywell and Bosch and Genentech and Milestone and RS2 and Open Options and Paycom and Sonitrol and all those, and ICT Protege, there's a specific receiver part number. And those are listed on our product guide as well. So we can get you the product guide. You can find that on our website. Um, if it's anything else, it's a matter of how many transmitters are you going to use, which would define which of the uh, add-on receivers you, you're going to pick. And there's three of those, so that's an easy choice as well. Okay. Okay, great. Um, can you connect four EH fire transmitters on one receiver? Nope, just one. Okay. Right now it's one to one. So, so for every transmitter, you would also need a receiver. Um, over time, I think we will be expanding that, but right now it's one to one. Okay. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I think that might have been your last question here, Sandy. Unless anybody else has any questions, but nope, it looks good. Um, Otherwise, before I pass it over to Eric for some closing words, um, I just wanted to remind everybody, I did share it in the chat, but we do have the Innovonics Weekly Cup. It's our weekly live stream. And next week on Tuesday, we'll actually have our very own Dave LaPuma presenting on how to win more business. So I hope you'll join us. And um, I'll be sending a follow-up email with a bunch of links and good stuff to you guys later today too. And that's it. So Eric, do you want to go ahead and say any closing words to wrap things up? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, thank you, Sandy, for the thoughtful content, you know, reminding everyone of the advantages of wireless. And, and Nikki, thanks for your help as well. Um, but uh, please make Innovonics a, a part of your uh, um, strategic part of your portfolio and uh, help yourself to help your customer there. Um, from there, I think that's it. Please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to our team or to our partners at ADI. It's been a great partnership for many years and uh, we plan to uh, make it many more. Thanks again. Michael, anything? Thank you, Eric, for the closing remarks. Sandy, thank you so much for uh, today's presentation. Nikki, great job of driving the bus. Uh, we can't do things without people like you. So I sincerely appreciate all of your efforts. This webinar was recorded and will be posted to the ADI YouTube channel. I'm also going to send it over to Nikki so that she can get it out to everybody. And uh, we'll make a point of having the Innovonics team reach out. So if you have some needs, they should be in touch with you very shortly. Uh, other than that, I thank you. Tomorrow's webinar is Fabaro. I think it was not properly advertised with respect to the date. I had it uh, as Wednesday the 16th, but I think ADI put it as Thursday the 16th. Do not be thrown off by that. And other than that, we look forward to the next time we get to work with Innovonics and thank everybody and please stay safe during these times. We'll see you tomorrow.